Hey, it is the first time we have an Emmy Award winner on our podcast. It is exciting. His name is James George, an entrepreneur and an artist. We are going to speak about volumetric film, his invention that been used in many industries. We will speak about his experience as the first artist in residence in Microsoft Labs. What is Depth Kit? The tool that even the rapper Eminem used. We will speak about what does it mean to be artist an entrepreneur, how you balance between the two, and what are the tips he can give to engineers that want to work with artists or artists that want to become entrepreneurs. You want to stick around till the end, because the conversation with James is full of stories, tips, and new ideas. So I hope you will enjoy. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking, Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to The Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey listeners, thanks again for coming back to another episode of The Artian. If it is your first time listening to us, we explore here how the intersection of art technology and entrepreneurship leads to innovation, how artists lead original thinking. Today, I'm excited to speak with a speaker that do exactly that. James George, a multidisciplinary creator, an artist and an entrepreneur that co-founded Scatter together with Alexander Porter and Yasmin Elayat. Hey James. Welcome. Hi, great to be here, Nir. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time, James. Can you take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm James George. I'm co-founder and CEO at Scatter. And prior to Scatter, I was a practicing new media artist. As an artist, I've had exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, the Barbican in London, and Tokyo Photographic Museum in, uh, in Ibisu. And my work... focused on computer programming, creative coding for the production of new types of images. So working with a moving image at a very low level to create new forms of expression at the intersection of interactivity and cinema. And how did you get to this world? You're at the middle of the intersection of art and technology. What led you there? That's a good question. Well, I'll, to, to answer it, I'll share a story. I went to college at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I... wanted to study digital art and experimental media. That was my intention when I went to school there. And it was a new program. It was very exciting. And the reason I wanted to do that, I was very interested in using video images as an art form. So not so much narrative video storytelling, but really thinking about video art and the, and the form of video to create installations and things like that. You know, my heroes at the time were Namjoon Pike, Bill Viola, Pipilotti Reist, and When I went to school to study that, I had to take a broad base of coursework to be able to qualify for that major. And one of those classes that I took was Introduction to Computer Programming. And it was taught by a professor, Stuart Regis, who had just joined the this, this school. And he was very inspirational to me. And I didn't know that I could program before that. I actually had tried to program before and failed utterly and told myself that I'd never be a computer programmer. <laughs> Because of this teaching style and how inspirational he is, I found myself uh, really interested in programming and you know, had a knack for it that surprised me. So there was one moment to get to this story where I had to choose between, because the courses were conflicting, I had to either take the next you know, digital arts and experimental media core prerequisite or the next computer science prerequisite. And I felt like at that point, I had to make a choice between being an artist and being a technologist. And it sort of set a theme for my life that I struggle with to this day. And, and I chose to study computer science. And the reason then was that I felt that I had the rest of my life to be an artist and being an artist is more of a, of a mindset and a way of life. And that the opportunity to learn the craft of computer science and engineering in, you know, as an undergrad at one of the best schools for it, University of Washington, it's a very competitive program on the level of Stanford and MIT. I felt that that was an opportunity that I should take for that moment in my life. So I chose to study computer science And, but continually applied that craft, that discipline, to the creation of artwork. 
I love how you refer to it, like engineering is the craft and art is the mindset and you actually utilize both in your own day to day and career. So I'm interested now that you are in the university, you start to work with artists, you start to work with the computer programmers, how you start to merge between the two. At that time, I still had the intention to become an artist. I wanted, that's what I wanted in terms of the job that I wanted in the world. Was James, to, you, to you, are a, you are an artist. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay, sure. But at that time, that was my aspiration. Uh, and I appreciate that. I wasn't certain what it would, what it meant to be an artist in the world. It was very opaque. You know, it's very mystical, especially as a, you know, a college undergrad, it's like artists are these like mythical figures. So I wanted to use the skills I was learning in the computer science and engineering coursework to work, to apply it, to execute and assist and collaborate with artists. And so again, back to this program, that was kind of my North star for college, the digital arts and experimental media program at the university of Washington. There was an artist there who I began working with as a technician to execute some of her concepts and her work. Her name's Carolina Sobeka. She really became a mentor to me then. With the, the sort of trade that we had was she gave me insight into the workings of an artist, how to apply for grants, how to conceptualize work, just how to follow your own ideas and have self-assuredness as an artist that, you know, to, to pursue crazy ideas or things that are really hard. And I would work with her to translate those concepts and work with computer programming and interactivity to execute interactive installations and projects that we would make together that would then show. And her craft, her skill, in addition to being the artist, was an, as a, a 3D animator and motion graphics artist. So it was actually quite, our crafts also merged quite well because we could do interactive live animation where she directed the animation parts of it. And then I worked on the programming side. So we also had uh, complementary skill sets. I'm interested to know, I mean, beside the technical part of what artist uh, is doing or how to apply to grants, what are, I would say, the kind of the insights of or new learnings that you had working with her about the way artists working in general? That's a really good question. I'll tell it then by explaining one of our projects uh, so it's more concrete. So the first, the really big project that Carolina Sebeka and I worked on was a project installation called Sniff. And Sniff is an interactive dog that is projected into abandoned storefront windows. So it would surprise people in their daily lives. And it would show up at night in storefronts. The surprising thing about this dog is it would react to you as a passerby, as a pedestrian. And you could touch the glass and it would growl at you. You could make sounds and it would look at you. If there are two people there, you could kind of compete to get the attention. You can hold out your hand and it would sit and put up its paw. And the way it was working was that there was uh, essentially surveillance technology. We literally were hacking surveillance cameras. What I learned to answer your question was really the process of having an idea as an artist and starting with a set of concepts. So for example, for this project, Carolina's concept was really about exploring theory of mind, human capacity to be able to imbue another thing, like another person or even an imaginary thing, like a virtual dog, with the sense the idea that it has agency and that we mind model, you know, everything around us to anticipate the actions and how we're perceived. And the surprising thing about this scenario is that everyone knows that this dog is not real. And yet we are compelled to act with it as if it were real. You know, you want to play with this dog because it, it's it, all the signals are there of dog likeness. And so we suspend our disbelief and we actually deploy our theory of mind in the scenario, even though we know there's no actual mind or no actual sentient agent there. And it gets into thinking about AI, ethics of AI, how we relate to machines. Uh, and it brings all that up on a conceptual level. And that was the thing I really learned. It's like, how do you work as an artist to have like a, a general thesis or area of interest and then execute projects that get at those and that are not directly necessarily talking about the academic or the intellectual side of it, but have a more visceral, experiential quality to them, uh, which is so engaging. I would like to ask you, do you have kind of the maybe three steps for listeners that want to take crazy ideas? Because I feel that always artists have this ability, as you mentioned, take crazy ideas and make them reality. Often in the business world, we are so focusing on improving what we have that crazy ideas immediately are kind of go out of the window. Yeah, sure. I mean, you're kind of asking me like three steps to make art. And that's like, <laughs> such. <laughs> we're, yeah, because it's not a linear process. 
I don't know if I can answer those in a way and feel like I have integrity because if I were imagining myself then being told, here's the three steps to make art, I would have like flipped the table. I'm like, this is <laughs> because it's soul searching work. It's like, it's about you're dealing with yourself. You're dealing with uh, abstract concepts that are ineffable. So I'd, I'd sort of change the question if you don't mind, which is what I learned from working with Carolina and have learned in my career as an artist about fundamental principles for make, producing artwork. And actually, we, we'll talk about this, but they're very similar to early stage startup entrepreneurship. And I see a lot of parallels there. I'm very happy that I'm you are saying it, uh, James, because one of my favorite quotes is that entrepreneurs are the artists of the business world. Yesterday, I read a quote by Jim McKelvey, the co-founder of Square, that he's also a glass artist, and he is also in the intersection of art and business. And he said that business people are very respected, they are very professional, but they are singing the song. They are not writing the music, and the entrepreneurs are writing the music. So I'm very happy that you said that because I see a lot of similarities. That's actually one of the things we will talk in a second. So you worked a lot with engineers and you also worked with artists. Do you see differences? Do you see similarities? I mean, how they are different maybe in their approach to work? Uh, what are the parallels I see between engineers and artists? And I think that the first thing I'll do is try to make a distinction about how those two words because I really see an art as a mindset, as a leading thing. So artists have vision and try to create, and the artists ask questions and then pursue answers to those questions to challenge uh, our society to be more human. And how they do that is different for every artist. It's whatever their craft is, whatever their means of expression. And engineering is a craft, it's a means of expression. It's a tactical process for executing ideas and making things work. And there's a lot of art to engineering, for sure. It's a, but I think that a word art is so complex because it does have take different forms in our culture. So in this, I'd like to set this frame, the distinction between art and craft, that engineering tends to be about a craft. It's a culture, it's a set of tools, it's a, a way of executing. And so I think artists who can be engineers it's interesting, uh, kind of the way, and correct me if I rephrase it in the wrong way. Artists lead with questions, engineers finding a solution and executing ideas, right? I think there that's is a, correct. I think there is a lot of room for collaboration over here, and that's why I encourage a lot of startup companies and generally business companies to work with artists. I think often people think about artists as painters that just paint without understanding, as just you said, art is a mindset and actually... They lead with questions and they hard questions that normally we don't like to ask ourselves. James, before we continue to discuss the depth kit and clouds and the Emmy Awards that sits behind your back now <laughs> that um, listeners cannot see it, but we will post the pictures. Let's take a short break. Hi, listeners. It's clear that our speakers are at the intersection of art and innovation, but they didn't just arrive there casually. They developed their skills, gained knowledge, and more importantly, grew their artistic mindset. Would you like to develop some of these skills, capabilities, or a growth mindset? Then I would encourage you to check our art-based learning experiences. Whether you want to build your leadership skills or your innovation competencies, our training can be just what you are looking for. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. Hey listeners, thanks again for coming back. I'm speaking with James, entrepreneur and an artist and the co-founder of Scatter that won the Emmy Award for his technology. So James, I want to kind of move and ask you actually about these movies that you started to do, volumetric films. What does it mean? I mean, you are the one even that coined the name volumetric films. What does it mean? How did you get to it? Volumetric filmmaking, uh, there's a lot of different ways to define it. The best way to think about it is the intersection of gaming and filmmaking with a little bit of theater dashed in there. The way I relate to it is that films can, think, think about filmmaking, it can express the whole breadth of, of, of stories. You know, anything that you think of being expressed in a movie, it's quite broad. Uh, and the reason it can do that is we relate so powerfully to photorealistic images captured from real people in real places. And of course, there's a lot of filmmaking involving animation and blends between the two that are, you know, all part of the beauty of that, of that genre of that craft. And 
then think about gaming. Gaming brings participatory nature to storytelling. It brings, you know, the adrenaline rush of like shooter games, but it also brings the, you know, the, this like age, sense of agency. Like you take, you embody a character within a world and you go on an adventure and games are great at telling that story. But traditionally games use synthetic graphics or animation, but they can be quite beautiful, but they don't have the same nature of being grounded in reality that we imagine from film, even fictional film, because we have actors. And over years and years, as graphics get better, and as our culture grows and desires more participatory and engagement because of the internet, these two genres have been naturally converging. Games are becoming more film-like, film is becoming more interactive. And what volumetric filmmaking is, the synthesis of those two things, like the complete convergence of it. It's almost like an ideal and we're starting to just work on it now. It's in its very early forms. It's, you know, the, it's in the, the nascent stages. And so what, when we make volumetric films, we're trying to explore at Scatter what this is. And how it takes place today is it's the use of 3D capture technologies like volumetric video, which we'll describe, 3D scanning, LiDAR. All the, all, there's all these new ways of capturing imagery with space. There's new types of video cameras. And bringing those into interactive 3D worlds, like with Unity, the game engine, and then allowing participants to explore those worlds and discover the story or even interact with other people being captured in real time as if they're there in person but could be anywhere in the world, like a hologram, that's what volumetric filmmaking is. So it's creating new spaces, new story worlds that we can explore and be immersed in that can tell the whole breadth of of the human experience and like like filmmaking can. So... You start to create those movies when? I found my way to it, this idea, over time. Coming back to these ideas of the art practice, my art practice and the concepts of my creative art practice after school was about discovering new forms of expression using moving images. And uh, that's probably, if you would have read my artist statement, that's what it said. It would have said something like that, some like high fluting combination of words involving interactivity, cinema, coding, you know. And I was after something powerfully new that was only recently available because of how fast new technologies are moving. There's all these, there's all this, this explosion of computational photography and new capabilities. And then I wanted as an artist to ask the question, what new forms of expression become possible now? And what if artists have access to these high technologies, what creative work will they produce? And so that was my focus. So I was writing code to transform images, to get access to new types of cameras that aren't otherwise readily available for creatives. And what happened was in 2009, 2010, Microsoft released the Xbox Connect as a new gaming peripheral. It was kind of they're competing with the Wii for doing kind of, you know, natural uh, user interfaces. But what was interesting about this camera, or the Xbox Connect, is that it had a different type of camera on it. It had a camera that could not just see color, like most cameras that we're used to, but it could also see space. It had lasers in it that were emitted into the world and it could capture the depth and the color of the world in front of it. And what was amazing about that is that's exactly how game engine rendering works. When you render a world in a game, you actually get the depth and the color. That means that we could start to represent the real world within a game engine. So it was the first time there was a camera that could actually film virtually. And the way that that uh, became available to, uh, well, I'll, I'll stop there and we can talk more about it. But the ability to start working with that new tool uh, really opened up the space for volumetric filmmaking for me. And I created uh, several creative uh, projects, photography projects with that capability, and then began my first uh, directorial project, which was Clouds. And I can I can talk yeah. about that later. Uh, I'm going, uh, going long. So No, 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 no. You're <laughs> going perfect. I mean, you know, because you find you're kind of starting to touch points that I always mention. I just said that before the break, people think about artists as painters. And I always say that artists are human beings just like us living in the same era, exposed to the same technology and changes in the world. And they are experimenting with everything. And what I love about artists is that they are always at the forefront of what we know and what we don't know. So you get this Xbox, a camera Xbox vision, and then you start to hack with that to do what? I'll give you a bit of backstory about how I got access to this camera because it's important to, the, to what I did with it. So at that time, 2010, I was participating in a group of, of creative coders, of hackers 
who produced open source software for designers and artists. And that was very unconventional, still unconventional, but even more so 10 years ago, where there's really not a lot of tools out there for artists and designers without technical training to work with code directly. A lot of technical toolkits assume an engineering background. I was in a unique position because I had the engineering background, but my intention was to support artists. So I was very attracted to working with building tools for artists uh, with code. So I was working in the open frameworks community, which is the C++ open source toolkit for artists to do uh, design and interactivity. And that group of people were the ones who hacked the drivers for the, the, the Connect when it came out. Yeah. So uh, it was, you know, Theodore Watson, Kyle McDonald, Joshua Blake, uh, Arturo Castro, like this group of folks. I wasn't involved in the driver hacking project, but it was part of the community. And when that happened, because Microsoft didn't intend for anyone to have access to the raw data streams of this device. They wanted it to be used with the Xbox only. We made it possible to plug it into your, your MacBook Pro and start to get data off the cameras. With and regular DSLR camera. Or this is later on? The DSLR was an addition to, okay. that, we, that we did. So this was just plugging in the peripheral okay. and getting this depth and color. And that community was very important to me and, and remains important to me. And what happened was I was invited to a residency at the uh, Carnegie Mellon Studio for Creative Inquiry in Pittsburgh by Golan Levin, who is also an active member of this community. And he runs this lab for creative artists. Uh, this, you know, this, the Studio for Cre Creative Inquiry sits between as a hybrid studio sitting between the School of Computer Science and the School of Art at uh, Carnegie Mellon, which is, again, a safe haven for folks like, like me. <laughs> and when at that residency, I met Jonathan Menard, and I was hacking on a way to capture video from the Connect because that's quite hard to actually capture 30 frames per second. But Jonathan Menard at that time worked at the studio, and he was the documentarian. And... We decided together, we had just met, that we would capture the, all of the hackers and artists at the residency using this new tool as we were inventing it. My process is always to experiment. It's always to try out a few different things and, and see what I think is most engaging and to kind of follow a tree. How far can we take these rules that we've made? The total fantasy is that you could read the book and you learn these basic building blocks and you understand about rules and you program this and you program And that. so we started to take these holographic interviews with all these artists talking about why they use code to create art. So that moment was the beginning of volumetric filmmaking in the way I know it now. And it was also the origin of the Project Clouds with those, inter those were the first interviews, which is a project that Jonathan and I went on to co-direct together. Uh, and that code that I was building ended up becoming the prototype to depth kit that is our product at Scatter now. So that was kind of the, this origin point. So let's talk for a moment about Clouds. What is Clouds? Clouds is an interactive documentary about artists who work with code. Specifically, it, it pursues the question of how networks and computer software affect creativity today and are challenging the, no the traditional notions of, of what it means to be an artist, similar to the questions you're asking in this podcast. And specifically, it documents a subculture of artists that design open source toolkits for designers and artists. Uh, and those specifically are open frameworks and another one called processing, which is a Java based open, uh, open source toolkit for doing creative expression with code. And the way clouds was made is it's an interactive documentary. So you can, it's very much like a video game. You can run it on your computer and it's also available in virtual reality. And it was built literally using the same open source toolkits that these artists create. And they are depicted, the artists are depicted as point clouds, as volumetric holograms within an interactive database of stories that the viewer can discover and navigate by asking questions. And so. it's kind of divided. It's divided by type of artist, divided by, if I'm correct, by type of projects. And I just, I downloaded it and I played with it and I highly recommend everyone to download it, even though you make it a bit challenging. And I'm sorry, James, that on Saturday I drove you crazy to help me figure it out. It's so funny. Yeah, no problem. I'm glad you got it working. Tell us about how it's structured, because it's beautiful. You control the movie as the viewer. You control which figure I want to see, which project I want to see, etc. Yeah, it's structured very much like a database of interviews 
where you can ask questions and it will, the clouds itself will generate a new movie for you that's different every time based on your questions and what you've seen. Um, so the way that clouds works is you start and there's two modes. You can uh, go into story mode, which allows you to kind of fly through a series of portals that it's essentially like a choose your own adventure where every portal has a different question. And on the other side of that portal is a, as a string of dynamically edited clips of, of the artists and hackers in the film addressing the topic at hand. And, you know, there's some famous people in the project. There's Paola Antonelli, who's the curator at MoMA. There's Bruce Sterling, who's a famous science fiction author, co-inventor of the, of the concept of cyberpunk with William Gibson, Theo Watson, Jer Thorpe, artists and technologists who've really pioneered the use of code for creating, creating images in art. And you're seeing interviews with them, and it's all running in real time with 3D graphics. And they're appearing as, the interviews are appearing as holograms. So they're sitting in virtual space, and the virtual space is organized into a huge cloud of information that depends on what they're talking about. So you imagine these pictures of the internet that you see where it's like these, this, this like spiraling web, it looks like a brain, you know, this like neural network. Yeah. And as a viewer, you're literally traversing a path through that and encountering the content and the stories as you go. So you can go on story mode, which is like flying and creating a traversal through the network, or you can zoom out and look at the whole network and choose to dive in in a specific point, either by topic or by artist. There's one part of the project that I'm very excited about, which is that these artists all work with code as their creative expression. So normally, you know, in documentary, you have like B-roll or, you know, you cut over talking with some kind of explanatory images. That happens in clouds as well. Although what, what happens is these artists all contributed actual running versions of their artwork in its most true form that are interactive, that show up, that you can interact with and play with, that are generative, that are different every time. So there's inside of Clouds is a living virtual art gallery of, and in some place, one of a kind artworks that we commissioned that, sh that also not only, only do the artists tell you what their work is, you can actually literally play with it on your computer running in real time. So there's a gallery of that artwork as well. So if someone wants to watch it, where they can watch it or download it? So you can go to cloudsdocumentary.com and there's two ways to get it. You can download the online version, and then you are basically streaming clouds as you traverse the network, it dynamically streams based on where you go. Or you can get a collectible USB key, which we make these holographic USB keys that uh, have the entire archive, like tens of hours of interviews. I think in total, we did 40 hours of interviews that are all tagged and immersed in this database. Uh, and the whole thing is on this you know, high capacity USB stick that when you plug into your computer, It runs the installer and lights up and you can, you know, have the highest quality version, but it's like an offline experience. So you can experience it either way. We'll share the links on the show notes uh, on our website. Before we continue to discuss the depth kit, I actually want to take you back to your childhood because all those people in the movie kind of represent the subculture in a way. People that started hacking new technologies, developing a new type of creative expression, etc., And you have relationship with the subculture as a child. Yeah. How did you get to that? Because that's something I relate a lot. So one thing that uh, it was a very formative experience for me in high school and how I got into video and media at all, I was a skateboarder. And so I, I became the kid who always had the video camera and was filming everybody. And what it turned into every year, we would make a skate video. Uh, of all of the tricks and stuff that the group would perform the year prior. We would screen them at local movie theaters every year and everyone would come out from our high school uh, and we distribute them on DVDs and perception began to shift. We would, even the police would see them and they would come and yes, they'd still kick us off the property and give us, you know, uh, fines for trespassing, but they would say, they would actually ask <laughs> about the tricks we were doing and they knew that we were not there to, with the intention to destroy things, but we were there as uh, creative athletes doing something Uh, and contributing to culture. And that really, that to see the fact that making media could affect culture and change perception uh, and tell the story of a subculture, get their ideas across that, are, that were otherwise misunderstood, that was what inspired me to make clouds because I felt the same way about the creative hackers in the open frameworks and processing community. They, people really didn't understand just how talented this group was as producing amazing artwork that's relevant to the whole world. And how 
uh, they defied the traditional notion of an engineer that's very utilitarian or just, you know, working within Silicon Valley to build companies. They're building, uh, they're creating, you know, artwork for expression and showing in galleries and working worldwide. So I wanted that story to be made clear with clouds in the same way that I did with the skateboard community. I think it's a beautiful story. James, you actually took this Uh, movies and your experience and abilities as a storyteller, as an engineer, as an artist. And you did a transition from someone that creating art to someone that built companies. And you moved into the entrepreneurial world. And today you are the co-founder of a startup called Scatter based in New York. Can you tell us a bit about what is Scatter? How did you, how it's even linked to what you did just before? Sure. Yeah. And I can, I can tell the story um, starting where Clouds left off. So Clouds went on to premiere at Sundance in 2014. And there, that was the first year that Oculus VR was at Sundance. And Sundance is a, is a very prestigious uh, independent filmmaking festival. As an independent filmmaker, it's kind of your goal to try to go to, to bring a film to Sundance. Also, it may be less known Sundance shows new media and interactive work in a, in a category called New Frontier. And Clouds was selected by the curator Shari Frilo to be at New Frontier in 2014. Shari also was working with Oculus to expose the filmmakers of Sundance to virtual reality, thinking, knowing intuitively, and she was right, that filmmakers would be very interested in this type of um, new interface that was at that time being designed for gamers. There I was, Sundance 2014. We actually had gotten an early version of the Oculus and actually ported clouds to the Oculus right before the festival. So we were showing clouds in virtual reality. And what I was struck there, all of these filmmakers were so interested in using virtual reality to uh, tell stories and were really excited about the ideas in clouds, you know, being able to choose your own path through the story, using a new interface, capturing 3D holograms instead of two-dimensional video. And that was literally a month before Facebook bought Oculus. So at that time, there was this amazing amount of investor interest in technology that could power virtual reality. So I began to connect the dots and see, oh, wow, maybe the ideas that I'm working with and the tools that I'm inventing here in the kind of creative arts and filmmaking world could actually become a product and a uh, product. be part of this new, new you, you know, the next generation of, of computing, which will be spatial computing through augmented and virtual reality. So you, you leave Sundance Festival with this insight, with this hunch that you own to something. What do you do then? So after Sundance, I was left with this, you know, kind of, it planted a seed in my mind. And at the time back in New York, there was an opportunity to join a new initiative that, At, that was started by the New Museum in New York. And it's still running today. It's called New Inc. And New Inc. is a, a creative arts incubator that is a, has a hybrid model. It's, it's different than an accelerator and it's different than a co-working space. And it's trying to create something very new it, with the intention of building sustainable creative practices for artists uh, by fostering skills of entrepreneurship. And what New Inc. brought to, to me and my, my co-founders at the time that we, we brought our company there in an early form, we were basically freelancers, and we were invited to join this incubator to really explore how to make our practice, uh, our creative art practice, sustainable long-term. And in that exploration, I identified both what, a, I even learned what the word business model mean. I didn't even know what it meant. Sometimes I still don't think I know what it means. <laughs> But uh, I was like, people would be like, what's your business model? And I would freeze. I'd be like, uh, is that like a 3D model? You know, is that like a mind model? Um, I just didn't have the language for even thinking about it. And I, honestly, I had an aversion to it. There was this idea that like capitalism or venture investment or investors was like, where you go to sell out, you know, as an artist. And I need to work outside of the economy. I need to, to be scrappy. I need to, you know, spend no money. And I think that actually was working against me because it meant I was working in isolation with no resources. And New Inc. provided the context to start to learn what it meant to think about business in the service of, of creativity. And I met investors uh, and other advisors there that they had brought in to have conversations with their incubees. So... Really, everything clicked at New Inc. 
because that's where I met Zach Schildhorn, who was our lead investor in Scatter. That's where we had at Lux Capital. That's where we decided to focus on DepthKit as a product, the tools that we used to make clouds that were open source at the time, that we could actually productize that. I learned thinking what product mindset meant. I learned about raising money and all of those things within a, a, a community that was that held space for the values of artists and didn't see it as either or. So now you, you are a founder. How many employees do you have now? So at Scatter, you know, we founded the company in 2016. So it was a few steps before those ideas really took hold. It's a long journey of entrepreneurship. And so founded in 2016. Today, we have 10 employees and we have a product in the market, uh, DepthKit, that has thousands of users. So tell us about this depth kit, because I think it's a beautiful story how artists actually can invent new tools. Sure. So at Scatter, we lead with our original XR content. So uh, Clouds was the first project that turned into the company. And then uh, we can talk about it a little bit later, but our flagship title, our, our virtual reality volumetric film with Zero Days VR, which is awarded an Emmy. The nominees for Outstanding New Approaches documentary are... The New York Times op docs, 10 meter tower, zero days VR, scatter. And the Emmy goes to zero days VR, scatter. We create this content in order to show what's possible for volumetric filmmaking. And everything we learn through making these projects as, uh, as an original content studio, we then fold into the product. And our business model, which I now know how to use that term, uh, our business model is we sell licensed software. Ultimately, the vision of Scatter and making this content and building these tools is to make holograms available to everyone. And anyone can represent themselves and tell their story from their perspective using this exciting new medium of volumetric filmmaking of, of holograms. And uh, the way we're doing that is we're building tools that allow, that make creating volumetric video very accessible. So Depth Kit is a software tool and a no-code SDK for game engines like Unity that allows you to use just a laptop and a handful of affordable 3D cameras. Back to, they're similar to the Microsoft Connect. Microsoft's still making the Connect, and, and now it's made for, for anyone to use. Uh, and you can use this equipment, and you can make holograms or volumetric video as easily as making videos. It's very much like making videos on a, a DSLR video camera. In fact, you can actually pair uh, it with uh, high-end film equipment to increase the quality. So Depth Kit empowers our customers, our digital interactive studios, making XR content and individual filmmakers and artists and freelancers uh, and some large tech companies doing research that are interested in building a new world for XR using real-life capture. And so Depth Kit, you know, the way it works is you plug a depth sensor into your laptop, you install the Depth Kit software, you log into it just like you do you know, Adobe Photoshop and or Adobe Premiere, and you capture your world in depth and color. So you're shooting on location like a video shoot. And then depth get processes that raw depth and color that's taking off of these sensors and turns it into holograms, into interactive content that can be played back uh, in, in r interactive websites, in game engines, and also brought into visual effects. I was going to go easy on you, not to hurt your feelings. And you have some few famous people, like uh, I think Eminem, that used your product for music videos, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. So there's a studio called Drive Studios and a director called Richard Lee, who does all of these the super famous music videos. He's done music videos for Eminem and uh, Lana Del Rey and Maroon 5. And he used the very early version of Depth Kit to capture uh, Eminem as a hologram for the music video Rap God, which actually in February just passed 1 billion views on YouTube. Wow. It's one of two, less than 200 videos that have a billion views. So a lot of people have seen this Depth Kit powered content. Uh, and That's a great and, marketing for an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it was in the very early days of the, of the tool. Yeah. And other, I can give you a few other examples if it's helpful, just to kind of ground it for folks. Yeah. So today, you know, there's a few, there's a few proof points. It, a very exciting project was there's a startup called The Wave, and they do virtual reality and interactive concerts. And they use Depth Kit to capture the artist image and heat and made a virtual reality live concert experience for her, hmm. uh, which you can see online. Uh, there's uh, this group in London, Territory Studios, 
they did uh, visual effects for a Hollywood feature film called Axel, where there's a robot dog with robot vision, and they used DevKit for the visual effects there. So not interactive, but highly stylized using holographic imagery. And you know that's a eight figure Hollywood feature film that yeah. has a lot of of DevKit. Uh, and then there's also like enterprise applications. So it's not just the creative sector. And I think a lot of people are surprised by that when I start telling these stories. So. For example, there's a, a studio in France called Convivial Studio, one of our customers, and they're working with an industrial manufacturer in Germany called Siegfried Moller, who does do injection molding. And they created a virtual factory tour of their plant and were able to capture holograms of their fabrication experts on location. And so that in virtual reality, you can actually tour the plant. It's a marketing and training tool for, uh, for that company. Yeah. So there's, and then there's, you know, some of these stories just like really fill my heart. So, you know, here I am in bed in Brooklyn and a neighborhood just down the road from me, Brownsville, there's a, a group of uh, teenagers at the Brownsville Community Justice Center, and they've literally recreated their whole neighborhood as a virtual reality game, including capturing hundreds of their neighbors as holograms in this, this big virtual world. And the intent of this project is to actually foster understanding and create respect across dividing lines to reduce uh, gang-related crime in the neighborhood. And they taught themselves Unity. They taught themselves Depth Kit. They captured all the holograms themselves. And you know, uh, it's just it's just such a uh, a powerful project. That's a great moment to mention our listeners that all the links to what James is mentioning, the videos and the projects, will be available on our uh, website on the show notes. So James, you are kind of in the intersection of art, entrepreneurship, you are an artist, you started your own company. And one of the experiences that you had is actually being in the role of an artist, but in a tech companies through the models of artists in residence. And you actually, with your experience and volumetric films, was invited to be the first artist in residence in Microsoft Labs. How was yeah. the experience? Can you tell us about these examples? So for those of you who may not be familiar, Microsoft Research is an organization within Microsoft that contributes to scientific progress of in computer science by publishing research and oftentimes works with many academic uh, institutions. So it's, it's a little bit of a, of a hybrid organization because they contribute to academic research, but it's housed within a, you know, a massive technology product company. They publish hundreds of papers a year. There's hundreds of researchers there, uh, and they have many locations across the world. And there was a group of researchers at Microsoft who wanted to change internal culture. So in 2013, I joined Microsoft Research as the first artist in residence to pilot an, art, an artist residency program within the Microsoft Research organization. And that has gone on to, it was very successful. Luckily, I didn't ruin it for everybody. Uh, <laughs> and it's gone on. There's been many artists that are now in residence there. Yeah, alumni yes. of the program. Yes. And one of the reasons that I was a good choice for the inaugural artist was that the, the relationships I had with the researchers there and the intention was they knew I have the technical expertise and training to work alongside the researchers and work with their tools and techniques directly. So I wouldn't be necessarily asking a lot of the researchers time. I could be autonomous. Now the, they've gotten so much traction for the program. And actually a lot of the artists that are coming in are, uh, are very diverse in their training and, and researchers spend a lot of time building their artwork and they see that as um, a good use of time. So it was really cool actually that that isn't a necessary barrier to entry anymore for the residency program. But in the inaugural mode, you know, seven years ago, they really wanted someone who could um, on a technical level speak at the level of the researchers, but then was publishing in an art context, not publishing in, in an academic research context. And that was the big thing that they wanted to transform. So back to the intention with the residency, when I spoke to the small group who were pioneering the residency program, they, from the organizational structure and incentive structure at Microsoft Research, there's no mandate to publish only into academic conferences or academic uh, journals. In fact, they, they actually are very broad in their definitions of how the researchers can publish. And it's, it's very open-ended. However, they were seeing that the researchers tended, because they're all similar kind of monoculture, uh, to be pu all publishing to the same conferences, to the same audiences, and maybe had a, were a little bit insular or, or weren't thinking outside the box. And so they wanted to bring in an artist to really challenge 
the mission of that organization to think more broadly about research and audiences with for research. And so I came in to uh, create artwork alongside the researchers that could be published both for the for the audience also a little bit was the institution itself. So I did a show at the end of my residency and showed a, a artworks and you know had conversations with the researchers. And then of course went on, we got pressed for the project and some of those artworks have gone on to show elsewhere. And so bringing, you know, and I credit Microsoft Research in the same way you do when you're academic researcher publishing at a conference. So that it brings value to the institution in that way. And how do you feel people responded to have art around them and having an artist actually working, even though you had the technical skills, how was the level of conversation, the kind of... Yeah, uh, I'll tell a story. So uh, the researchers I was working with is a pioneer of volumetric video, invented some of the core foundation of all computer graphics, Oscar award-winning researcher, Charles Loop. And by the end of the residency, Charles Loop was sitting uh, in a ball pit with his kids being captured using his own technology as a, as a hologram playing, playing, like, playing with toys. And I remember looking at this moment, I'm like, how did this happen? Like this very serious researcher uh, you know, I mean, he's a, he's got a sense of humor, obviously, uh, but I don't think it's something that would normally have happened in his day to day life. And how this happened was, you know, I was so interested in volumetric capture. I didn't even know what to call it. I was working with the Connect. I was invited to this, uh, you know, the organization that created the device. And then I found all these researchers working with super far out techniques. You know, some of those techniques that I found then are just now coming to market, you know, 10 years in advance of the market. And I was just overjoyed with the creative power of these techniques because they also weren't productized yet. So they were very open-ended what this research could be applied to. So I began conceiving artworks for those, um, for what the researchers were working on and convincing the researchers to let me use their code to set up uh, art, art installations basically, or to capture things. So Charles was working on a very small volumetric capture rig that could do real-time streaming. So you could basically turn into hologram in real time. And I was like, let's set up a huge one. I just talked to this other, other group and they have this big empty space. And then like I went and I stole a bunch of equipment and I set up this big rig and I, and I had a dancer friend in Seattle uh, that I collaborated with during college because it was back in Seattle again at, at Microsoft. And we, I made this uh, interactive video installation and I invited Charles and his kids to check it out. And we were like, just experimenting, we're just playing around. So for me, what I saw happening was I really, uh, my point of view on the researchers' work got them excited about what they were working on in a new way. And, I think, and got I them think out you summarized it like yeah. beautifully. It's kind of go back again. Why I always think that artists need to be part of the business environment. I think that it fosters different conversation. And just as you said, you took the technology, push it even forward in order to give it maybe a different expression and then bringing this person with to have experiment with his kids and getting excited about his own work. I think it's a beautiful example how artists actually can help you in your organization to create a different dynamic, which is not yeah. necessarily can be translated to money. But at the end, there is no better, I think, thing that to have happy employees that satisfied with what they are doing, proud in what they are doing and creating kind of a great environment that can help push things forward. James, you know, I have a question for you. I guess that some of the people listening to our conversation and they say, obviously, James is very successful, you know, he's super smart, super creative, but the fact that he's an engineer probably brought him where he is. And I want to hear your take. What would you answer to someone like that? Yeah, and there's two parts to that, to how I'd respond to that. And the first is an acknowledgement. The first is, yes, I was fortunate and privileged to have been trained as an engineer and have had a, a natural sense for the skill. And in our culture, I think we value to the point of overvaluing engineering contribution. So engineers kind of get an easy pass. They have very high salaries. They you know, are, are respected in a way and like lauded. Um, so it was very helpful that I mean, when I needed to, I could put on my technologist hat and it could open doors for me, similar to how I you know, explained with Microsoft Research. However, I would also say that it doesn't have to be that way. And if you're listening to this and not relating to my story because you yourself are not an engineer, I would encourage you to challenge that thinking. And going back to um, 
the, the, this original distinction that we set up of art versus engineering, really what is the important skill and I think what needs to be valued more is the few folks who have the uh, courage and the vision to take on the role of artist and find however to execute those ideas. And if, if you have ideas that, and you're very compelled to, to work as an artist or to do things that seem crazy or impossible, and you're concerned if you don't have the skills because you don't yourself have an engineering training, there's a lot out there for you to, um, to work with that, even if you're not the same as me. So for example, similar to how I collaborated with uh, Carolina, there are a lot of engineers out there who are really dying to work with artists and don't know who the artists are or haven't been asked or aren't even know that that's possible. So find, you know, put it out there, ask for collaborators, talk freely about your ideas and get, get people excited about it. You'll find that there's a lot of talent out there looking for things to work on. And also a lot of folks have had, who are creative by nature, have had bad experiences with engineering culture because of engineering culture because of, you know, it's, it's a traditionally very homogenous culture. It's, it's white, it's male, it's, you know, there's, uh, it's can be very competitive and, and exclusionary elitist. And that's something that I think is about the culture and not about the actual craft and discipline. And I stand for that changing. So one thing to think about is look for places where engineering is taking place outside of that traditional culture or in opposition to it. For example, again, back to open frameworks and processing, a lot of the, the people who make amazing artwork with use, uh, leveraging code are not engineers. They've actually found uh, ways of using just enough computer science or enough programming to execute the idea. And, and they're not doing it for the sake of the engineering, but they're doing it for the sake of whatever their expression is. And there's toolkits and communities out there for supporting learning and doing in that way. Well, first of all, thank you for the elaborate answer. I always kind of encounter this sarcasm or skepticism when it comes to artists. Why artists and how they can actually contribute? And I think following what you said about thinking about this as a mindset, artists leading with questions, artists leading with vision, artists leading with crazy ideas and actually fulfill them, we can learn a lot from that experiences. And by the way, for our listeners, if you are an engineer that want to work with an artist, drop us an email. We will help you find an artist that is looking for an engineer. This is what we want to do to create these bridges. So, uh, James, we are getting to the end of our conversation and I want to kind of maybe go one step back. Someone that may be a, maybe a business manager or business leader listening to you and wants to start their own artist in residence or want to collaborate with artists. What are the, I don't know, one, two, three tips that you will give them? How to do it right? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's very challenging for a corporation to set up an artist residency program correctly. And there's a few pitfalls uh, that I see happen common, happen, happening quite uh, often. And just for the record, most large tech companies have artist residency programs of some type. So I mentioned Microsoft is very developed. Facebook has a similar residency program. Uh, similar initiatives exist at, at Google as well. So this is not like a, a niche thing. This is something that's thought about across the industry. Spotify has a very active artist residency program. And the, the things, I'll, I'll, I'll mention some trappings just to talk about it directly. So one of the major trappings to, to barrier to entry is acknowledging the artist's business model and making sure that the residency is fit to work with that business model. So I'll be specific. When one works as a career artist for their entire lifespan, it's not dissimilar to being like a musician or a filmmaker where you own your rights to your work. And that's actually how you can build a sustainable life as an artist uh, is continuing to own what you make as yourself and licensing it and working with essentially the intellectual property that you generate as an artist. So often the challenge is, is that traditionally corporations by default boilerplate, they own everything that any, is made with anything made anywhere on their premises or using their equipment. That's just the, that's just table stakes. If you want to start an artist residency, pro artist residency program and get serious artists to join, you're going to have to be able to make accommodations for ensuring that they, un they own their work. And you you'll get very nuanced with it because you obviously don't want to compromise your own IP, as a, as especially the technology company. And it's a very solvable problem. There's always a way, depending on what your product is and the artist sensitivity, to um, you know, negotiate a way for the artist to be able to come away from the residency uh, making sure that whatever they are building in your walls can contribute to their career trajectory. And so that's, a, that's something to establish at the beginning. 
another aspect uh, is about what part of the organization you intend the artist to contribute to. Like, how do you actually, how do you measure your ROI for their presence? And I think too often I've seen the trapping where artist residencies are created as a cheap way to generate marketing content in the traditional marketing organization. They think they can pay someone less than they would have to pay a creative director to like do cool stuff and make ad, you know, ad content. And an artist who's serious, again, will not appreciate being um, kind of turned into a zoo animal that way and uh, put on display. So be thoughtful about the uh, goal, your goals with the artwork and clarify that to the artist to make sure they're on board with the expected ROI for the organization. Um, often I see uh, an ROI that's missed that uh, goes back to the Microsoft example where I think savvy artist residency programs are actually about shifting internal culture shift the relationship that your employees, your product managers, your executives, your engineers have to the product itself. Let them see the product from a new perspective. Give the artist free reign to work with internal tools, external product, and to try new things, pull the boundaries off. And you'll find that you, you, it will energize your, your uh, employees in a way that you didn't think was possible because similar to this example with Charles Loop, uh, my mentor from Microsoft Research, like, we learned all the ways that his system worked and didn't work when produced at scale, when we were trying to set it up in 10 minutes, when we, I'm trying to hack it to do, you know, to create a cool visual effect or show it in a different way, like never would have tried that, you know, if we're working day to day based on the OKRs that are in place. So I think investing in internal culture first, and then yes, if you get some great um, marketing or PR out of that with artist consent, uh, that's great. But to me, start there, start with um, focusing inward on how you can innovate you foster innovation using artists in your in your walls. Well, James, I think, you know, you kind of, I, I like the last, especially the last part to my question, thinking about beyond just the marketing, thinking beyond, I would say, uh, just the technology, but thinking about your people and how actually art put them in the center. Now in the business world, we have what we call human-centric design. And I think that in a way, at least for me, Art was always human-centric. It is about human, it is for human, and it is made by human. So how come we don't integrate this way of thinking? James, I want to give you the opportunity to say last thoughts, last tips, whatever you want to say before we finish. Sure. Yeah, actually, what came to mind is the converse of the question you asked, which is I'm an engineer and I want to become an artist, but I don't know how. And I, I'd like to answer that question because in some ways that's where I was. Uh, and, you know, speaking kind of on behalf of a company earlier who wants to bring artists in, but the inverse exists too, right? And one thing that I want to also acknowledge is that I wouldn't be able to have gone on the career trajectory I did go on without other more traditional artist residencies that focus on fostering art and technology. So specifically iBeam being the, the most uh, one that helped me the most and is very prolific and long standing. And then I, I want to acknowledge Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media in Japan gave me a, a residency for four months where I worked on significant parts of clouds and contributed to open source as a researcher within their arts organization. And if it wasn't for all of those residencies that allowed me to make a living in the time where I was exploring these ideas, I would have not been able to, to do what I've done. I would have uh, likely had to work inside of the advertising industry directly or, or in a tech company as an engineer. Um, and I wouldn't have had the chance to develop this side of, of you know, my, my life. So uh, those that residencies are available. It's scary. Take the leap, apply, explore the ideas. And something amazing will come from it if you take the space to just explore. James, I think it's a great message for the engineers that are listening to us how to actually transform for the business people that are listening to us, how to actually connect with artists. And with that, I want to say big, big, big thanks for taking the time and share all your valuable insights and inspirational stories. Yeah, I appreciate the platform, Nir. This couldn't be more perfect. Uh, we're made for each other a little bit here. So I'm grateful for uh, the invitation to, to join today. Thanks again. We are producing our podcast without any ads, and we are relying on our community's direct support. People like you, our listeners. So if you find it valuable, I will be super grateful 
if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and maybe a review. It will take you just 30 seconds to do so, and it is very helpful in getting these ideas to a wider audience. If you are interested to develop your artistic mindset, if you are looking to grow your business, if you want to develop the innovation competencies in your organizations, I will highly recommend you to check our workshops and trainings, all available on our website. The episode was mixed and mastered by Daniel Duran. You can subscribe to the Artian Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. So I will be waiting here for you in the next episode with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, Thanks for listening.